Good afternoon. Thank you very much for being uh, uh, with us today um, for a very exciting discussion we're going to have about maintaining an independent judiciary in the face of political challenges. Uh, a topic that is now at the forefront of political discussion in a lot of countries, uh, uh, very much including our own. Um, we're going to have two uh, insightful perspectives um, on this set of issues. Uh, first, from uh, Chief Justice Tasuduk Jelani uh, from Pakistan, um, who served as the 21st Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan from uh, 2013 to 2014. Uh, he has had a distinguished career as a lawyer and as a jurist uh, in the country of Pakistan, as well as playing a significant role in discussions of international law on the global stage. He began practicing as a lawyer uh, in 1974 at the district court level and soon established a reputation uh, as an independent and balanced judge, uh, as an advocate and a proponent for the separation of powers, uh, which has uh, been uh, a fundamental position he has maintained during his time in public life in Pakistan, uh, as well as being an important advocate for uh, the rule of law. He served as the judge of the Lahore High Court from 1994 to 2004 before joining uh, the Supreme Court. He has served as Advocate General of Punjab, as a member of the Punjab Bar Council, as General Secretary of the District Bar Association of Multan, uh, as a co-chair of the Working Party on Mediation and Family International Law for the Hague Conference, and as a co-chair of the World uh, Justice uh, Project. He has a Master's in Political Science from Foreman Christian College and a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Punjab, as well as an Honorary Doctorate in, in Humane Letters from the University of Southern Virginia in the United States. Uh, as you enter today, you may have heard uh, music in the background. Uh, and that music was a poem uh, that Justice Jelani has written himself, entitled Justice for All. Uh, it was declared as the official anthem of the Supreme Court of Pakistan in a meeting of the full, full court, and it is described in an entry wall uh, for the court. Uh, in that poem, it gives a vision that was part of the founding of the country of Pakistan of democracy for all, where Hindus and Muslims cease to be Hindus and Muslims when it comes uh, to the political sphere. Uh, after we uh, enjoy words from Justice Jelani, we'll have uh, the Honorable Margaret McEwen uh, give uh, some remarks. Um, uh, uh, Judge McEwen is on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit Court, uh, where she was uh, nominated by President Clinton and confirmed by the United States Senate, uh, uh, Senate in 1998. Uh, getting Senate confirmation these days is a, uh, a significant uh, uh, accomplishment. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Judge McEwen has also had a distinguished career uh, in both uh, the national legal sphere here in the United States and in international law. She was the first female partner at Brooklyn's Co. in at Seattle, Washington, uh, where her early career focused on intellectual property, handling major corporate clients. Uh, during her time on the Ninth Circuit, uh, she has developed uh, as uh, uh, a reputation as an international expert on international law and human, human rights law, and has played an instrumental role in the training of jurists uh, from around the world, from Latin America, from Asia, from the Middle East, uh, and from Europe. She has served as a chair of the American Bar Association Rule of Law International Board, and is a past president of the Federal Judges uh, Association. She has uh, earned her BA from the University of Wyoming, uh, her JD from Georgetown, and also has an honorary uh, doctorate from Georgetown. Uh, she has ser serves on many boards and honors, the most significant of which is the American Bar Association <coughs> Margaret Brent Women, uh, Margaret Brent uh, Women Achievement Award. Um, Perhaps her second most significant award comes as the Girl Scouts uh, Cool Woman Award. Uh, as the mother of two Girl Scouts, uh, her uh, contributions to that uh, organization for many years is something uh, I deeply appreciate. So we're, we're really privileged to have you both here today. Um, the occasion for Justice Jelani's visit here uh, uh, at UC San Diego is his serving as a Pacific Leadership Fellow. The Pacific Leadership Fellows Program was uh, created through a transformative gift by Joan and Erwin Jacobs, which established the Center on Global Transformation 
at, UC, at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD. Uh, since the center's founding in 2006, we have had uh, 79 Pacific Leadership Fellows from over 20 countries. During Fellows' time on campus, we use uh, this as an opportunity to get to know individuals who are playing a significant role in political and economic debates in their home countries, uh, as well as to, to gain insight for areas in which we can further our education and research uh, in the United States. Uh, Justice Jelani, it is our deep privilege to have you with us today. I felt humbled uh, what you said. And let me at the outset express my deep sense of gratitude to Peter Kwawe and School of Global Policy and Strategy for inviting me to be a Pacific Leadership Fellow and for providing me the opportunity to be with you this afternoon. I also thank Edmund Jacobs for establishing this school because of which I'm here. And you, Judge McEwen, I owe special thanks for honoring me by your presence and for being a co-speaker this afternoon. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. The topic which has been mooted is not only topical, but it has been a recurrent theme of all transitional democracy, that is, the conflict between judicial independence and political impunity. John Marshall, through a seminal judgment, laid the foundation of judicial independence in the US. When your constitution did not provide for the power of judicial review, he said, and I quote, it is emphatically the province and duty of judicial department to say what the law is. Those who apply the rule to particular cases must of necessity expound and interpret that rule. If two laws conflict with each other, the courts must decide on the operation of each." Unquote. But few judiciaries <coughs> in the developing world have lived through such a conf conflict as in Pakistan, which was marked by a progressive journey from judicial pragmatism slash expediency to judicial courage. In our country, the political challenges mostly came from the battle of the gun through martial laws and army takeovers. There have been periods of constitutional abrogations of constitutional deviations and of holding the Constitution in abeyance on the account of these army takeovers. And in these difficult times, the Supreme Court was called upon to decide on the legality of the action taken and on the restoration of the constitutional rule. The first martial law was promulgated in 1956 when, when two years had passed of the promulgation of our first constitution. The dilemma, the, 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 the martial law order was challenged before the Supreme Court. And the dilemma before the Supreme Court was twofold. 
Now, on the one hand, validating the army takeover while simultaneously ensuring the country did not deviate from the tracks of constitutional governance. In Doso versus the state, the court turned towards positive jurisprudence and used Hans Kelsen's theory of legal revolution in order to validate the imposition of martial law. The court referred to this doctor, doctrine of effectiveness as though for Kelsen, the mere, effective, the mere fact of effect, effectiveness was sufficient for legal validation of the Revolutionary Government's Acts. However, this interpretation was con contrary to what Kelsen actually said. For while he said effectiveness was necessary for validity, it was not sufficient, meaning that the mere fact of control was not enough. Needless to say, the court's interpretation and application of this theory came under severe criticism. It should be noted, however, that the Constitution stood abrogated at that time, but one thing the court should be accredited for is that by way of this decision, it unequivocally, unequivocally declared that country's sole method of governance would continue to be by way of constitutional rule. This martial law was, however, lifted in 1962. There was constitutional democracy till March 1969, when the country plunged into yet another constitutional and political crisis, leading to the imposition of the second martial law, and the constitution was once again abrogated. The political turbulence and war with India led to the separation of East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. The chief martial law administrator was forced to hand over power to polit with the political party, which commanded majority in the western wing of the country, that is the areas which now constitute Pakistan. And late Zulfikar Ali Bhutto became the president. The issue, the issue of legality of that martial law once again came to before the Supreme Court. And this time, the court revisited the earlier judgment and held, and I quote, that no valid law comes into force from the foul breath or smeared pen of a person guilty of treason against the national order." Unquote. In 1973, the parliament unanimously passed a new constitution, and it was because of its widespread approval and acceptance that it continues to be the constitution of the country. In 1977, general elections were held and there was serious allegations of rigging against the ruling parties. The, it provided an excuse to the army to take over. It dismissed the prime minister, arrested him, and he was ultimately tried in a murder case, convicted and hanged. The Supreme Court at that time justified the army takeover on the ground of state necessity and the principle of salus populus suprema lex. The court found that on account of massive rigging in the 1977 elections, the state machinery had crumbled down and the constitution did not provide a remedy. 
This period of constitutional deviation continued till 1985 when the Constitution was revived with Eighth Amendment, which was approved by the Parliament. However, General Zaulhaq died in an air crash in 1988, which paved the way for general elections and the restoration of civilian rule. From 1988 to 1999, the country was being ruled by a democratically elected government. In October 1999, the then Prime Minister of Pakistan dismissed the Chief of Army Staff because he was apprehending, app apprehending that he's likely to take over. But the General Musharraf reacted and took over the reins of the government, suspended the constitution, and dissolved the National Assembly. He also arrested the Prime Minister of Pakistan on the allegation that the Prime Minister wanted to hijack the plane in which the Chief of Army Staff was coming after a foreign tour from Sri Lanka. This, according to General Musharraf, was done so that the new appointee could take over as Chief of Army Staff. Now, this army takeover of General Musharraf was challenged again before the Supreme Court. Uh, the worries of the action taken by General Musharraf was sub judice before the Supreme Court when the general apprehending that the Supreme Court this time may decide against the army passed a new provisional constitutional order which prescribed a special oath for judges of the Supreme Court and High Court, and those who did not take oath were laid off. As a consequence, and as provided in the provisional constitutional order, order, several judges of the Supreme Court and High Court were declared to have ceased to be judges because they did not take fresh oath. Now, the Supreme Court, the newly constituted Supreme Court, because six judges of the Supreme Court had been laid off, and the new Supreme Court, a more compliant court, validated the army takeover and even allowed the president to amend the Constitution, but imposed a condition that He'll be there for three years, and he'll have to restore the civilian rule. This period of constitutional deviation came to an end in 2002, when fresh elections were held. Uh, certain amendments made by the Chief of Army Staff were validated through 17th Amendment passed by the Parliament. General Musharraf, through a highly controversial referendum in, uh, held in April 2002, got himself elected as president of Pakistan for a period of five years. In October 2007, and th this is the beginning of the most significant period in Pakistan's constitutional history. In October 2007, when General Musharraf's term of office was about to expire, he wanted to contest for the second term while retaining the office of the Chief of Army Staff. His eligibility to, to do so was challenged by one of the candidates who happened to be a former Chief Justice of a province. Now, only a compliant court could have allowed him to contest the presidential elections because there was a constitutional bar. The bar was that no civil servant can contest for an elected office 
till the expiry of a period of two years after his retirement. Not, not to speak of retirement, he was still wearing the army uniform. Now, on 9th of March 2007, he asked the Chief Justice, he summoned him to the army house, asked him to resign because you know, socially he was asked to ensure that he gets permission to conduct the election and his candidature is validated. He said, well, it's before a different bench. I'm not hearing this case. It is being heard by 11 member bench and incidentally I was member of that bench which was hearing the question of his, the legality of his candidature. So he asked him to resign and on his refusal to resign, he filed a reference of misconduct against him before the Supreme Judicial, Judicial Council and suspended him. Since the Supreme Judicial Council under the Constitution is headed by the Chief Justice, so he, he appointed a new Chief Justice, acting Chief Justice, although there was no provision of such a thing in the Constitution. Now this, for the first time, sparked of a protest by lawyers, civil society, and the general public. They came on the streets in support of the Chief Justice, and the Chief Justice filed a constitutional petition challenging the uh, reference filed by General B. Musharraf. And that case came before a bench of which I was also a member. Uh, in July 2007, the Chief Justice, you know, he was addressing bar associations. Now, he was, that day, he was to address the Islamabad High Court, and five minutes before he entered the bar, there was a big bum blast in the bar. Twelve lawyers got killed, and 27 were injured. There was immense tension in the city. About 11.30 p.m., the senior judge who was heading the bench which was seized of the issue of General Musharraf's candidature, he called me to say, Justice Jelani, uh, I'm coming to you, there's something important. I said, you are senior, I'm coming. Oh, he said, no, 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 I'll come. So we all judges have a, a apartments close by. So he walked down toward my apartment, apartment and said, you know, the situation in this city is very tense. I have reports that um, there could be a bum blast in the court. So um, what do you think if we postpone this case, adjourn this case, Sanadai, till things settle down. So my immediate reaction was, sir, let them blast the court. We'll announce the judgment on the street, on the Constitution Avenue. Let history be a witness to it. So we didn't, I, uh, it, it, we didn't agree that it should be adjourned. Two days after that, we allowed the Chief Justice, we allowed the Chief Justice's petition and restored him. So there was tremendous jubilation all over. Now, this judgment of the Supreme Court made General Musharraf all the more insecure because he was still in power. The question of legality of his candidature was still pending before the Supreme Court. So uh, he thought of a still more drastic action and 
there were rumors in the capital city that he is going to impose yet another martial law. The president of the Supreme Court Bar Association, he filed a petition before the court that, sir, these are our apprehensions. You pass an order directing uh, the governors not to comply with any illegal order. You direct the judges not to take special oath if there is any order to that effect. So the court did pass an order, and the order said, the gum, I quote, the government of Pakistan, president and prime minister of Pakistan are restrained from undertaking any such action which is contrary to independence of judiciary. Number two, no judge of the Supreme Court or the High Court shall take oath under any provisional constitutional order. Number three, the chief of army staff, corps commanders, staff officers, and all concerned civil and military authorities are hereby restrained from acting on any such provisional constitutional order. Number four, they are also restrained to undertake any such action which is contrary to judicial independence. And the main case of uh, General Musharraf's eligibility was directed to be placed before a full court next week. The same evening when this order was passed, General Musharraf imposed state of emergency. And along with that, he issued a provisional constitutional order which prescribed a special oath of loyalty to General Musharraf. And it was stipulated that any judge of the Supreme Court or High Court who does not take fresh oath, he shall stand retired. Uh, 12 or 13 judges out of 17, 11 judges out of 17 refused to take oath in the Supreme Court. And 69 judges from the four provincial high courts, they also refused to take fresh oath. Uh, again, there was countrywide protests. And every day, the protest was mounting. The lawyers, people from the civil society, the public, the media, so much so that for the first time in the history of American Bar Association, the lawyers, American lawyers, came on the streets in DC and paraded toward the Pakistan High Commission demanding restoration of the Chief Justice and the judges of Pakistan. Uh, the general, perhaps, was also asked by his friends in DC to be seen and announce elections. He was still resisting, and Benazir Bhutto, who was on self-exile, in the meanwhile, she came to the country and addressed a public meeting in the capital city in support of the Chief Justice and the judges. When she was coming out of the public meeting, she was shot dead and killed. That added fire to the fuel. The entire country was ablaze. And within a week, General Musharraf had to announce fresh elections within a month and a half. The elections took place. People's Party came into power. 
People's Party and the Opposition Party both decided to, to uh, file impeachment proceedings against the president. Under that fear, he resigned. And I, I believe there was behind the scene, uh, uh, this was brokered by uh, perhaps Condoleezza Rice that don't impeach him, he'll resign. So he resigned. And the elected government restored the chief justice and the judges. Now this has been a renaissance for judiciary in Pakistan. This has been a renaissance for civil society in Pakistan. And the American Bar Association awarded its 2008 The Rule of Law Award to the judges of Pakistan for their courage in defending the Constitution. And I was honored by, uh, by the bar to come to New York in the annual luncheon and receive the award on behalf of the judges of Pakistan. I, at the 12th hour, I couldn't make it. And I received a telephonic call from the director of the American bar that, sorry, we'll miss you, but do you grant us permission? If we could read out the remarks, your remarks in the luncheon, I said that, that would be my honor, but only one condition. I said, I still, I continue to be a judge. We had not been restored as yet. Therefore, I would like my remarks to be read by a sitting judge of US, of at least a court of appeal. And the third day, I was pleasantly surprised. I received a call from the ABA that Judge Clifford Wallace was gracious enough to agree, and he read out the remarks. I am still beholden to you, Judge. Thank you very much. So uh, after the restoration of the Chief Justice and the other judges. We reviewed the judgment of the Supreme Court whereby the Chief Justice, the acting Chief Justice, who was appointed by General Musharraf had validated his action. We set aside that judgment in review. And we directed that all those judges who had taken special oath of loyalty to Jerem Musharraf be proceeded against for violating the order of the Supreme Court uh, and for gross misconduct. Most of them, rather all of them resigned rather than face mis uh, charges of misconduct. Uh, yet another case in which uh, the Supreme Court asser asserted itself in the fa face of political challenge was uh, the case of uh, Yusuf Raza Gilani, the Prime Minister of Pakistan. You know, there were serious cases of uh, corruption against uh, the, uh, the President the, of Pakistan and uh, uh, during General Musharraf's regime, there was a compromise uh, between Benazir and General Musharraf on account of which those cases were dropped. And the case pending before the Swiss court was directed to be, was, was requested by the Attorney General for Pakistan because Pakistan was a, uh, was a complainant in that case that we, do, we, we don't want to pursue that case. So the Supreme Court, after restoration, directed 
that the Attorney General should write to the Swiss court that those cases be resurrected. And on refusal of the Attorney General and the Prime Minister, the, the prime, sitting Prime Minister were proceeded against on charges of uh, contempt. He was convicted and sentenced for imprisonment till rising of the court. And uh, on the basis of that conviction, he, he was held to be, un, uh, dis, uh, to, to remain, uh, he was uh, declared unfit to remain as Prime Minister of Pakistan. Uh, Now, in view of our frequent uh, martial laws, they, they, uh, special provisions have been inserted in the Constitution to ensure that the Constitution is not abrogated. Uh, for instance, Article 6 prescribes that any person who abrogates or subverts or suspends or holds in the bains or attempts or conspires to abrogate or subvert or suspend or hold in the bains the Constitution by use of force or show of force by any other constitutional means shall be guilty of high treason, unquote. Uh, the Supreme Court, besides being the last court of appeal, both under civil and criminal law, has power to pass any order on a question, question of public importance with reference to the enforcement of the fundamental right. And to buttress the authority of this Supreme Court, the Constitution prescribes that all judgments of the Supreme Court shall be binding. Well, ladies and gentlemen, religious freedom, uh, sorry, religi religious extremism has also led to pressures and an atmosphere of fear in the country. There are pressures on justice system that cannot be attributed to politicians. Perhaps one of the biggest threat to judiciary's independence comes from the orth religious orthodoxy. So therefore, in such a socio-political milieu, Courts have to play a more proactive role in the enforcement of fundamental rights and the rule of law. It was this perception and belief which persuaded me as Chief Justice of Pakistan to take Suomoto notice of a bum blast incident at a church in Peshawar in which 84 Christians died and several got injured. I called religious leaders of all sects, issued notices to Attorney General, the Advocate General of, of four provinces, and after hearing all concerned, delivered a detailed judgment. It was Interalia held that all citizens, Muslims and non-Muslims, have equal right to believe, to practice, and to propagate their religion. I issued eight directions to the state, which included changing the curricula, school and college curricula, 
banning the hate speeches on social media, creation of a special force to protect the places of worship of minorities, and the establishment of a national council on minority rights. I thought, who would ensure its implementation? Because judges pass judgments, but its implementation is a different ballgame. So I provided a mechanism within the judgment. I directed that a three-member bench of the Supreme Court shall be constituted to ensure enforcement of this judgment in letter and spirit. And this three-member bench still exists. This brief overview of the working of the Supreme Court would indicate that the Constitution grants white powers to the Supreme Court, but the magnitude of injustices it is confronted with is still wider both quantitatively and qualitatively. qualitatively. In absence of responsive and credible institutions of law enforcement, people tend to bring every cause, every grievance, and every list before the constitutional courts, and in particular before the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court has been empowered under the Constitution to take notice of any case directly. The court, by and large, has a frame from interfering in matters of public policy. It has maintained that it is not the function of the court to get embroiled in politics and passions of the day. The judge's perception on such matters has been, and I quote, the Constitution does not constitute us as platonic guardians, nor does it vest in this court the authority to strike down laws because they do not meet our standards of desirable social policy." Unquote. Pakistan, as most of you are aware, is a religious state in terms of the Constitution. But there is a comprehensive chapter on fundamental rights, which includes freedom of religion. The court, through its judgments, has endeavored to ensure that the enjoyment of this religious, right of religious freedom does not lead to myopic view of religion are to the infringement of a similar right of other religious minorities, and that it does not violate the fundamental rights provision of the Constitution. It struck down a law which was being passed by a provincial assembly, which was based on a rather retrogressive interpretation of Islam, and the, court, the Supreme Court said it is violative of fundamental rights. The challenges faced by judiciary in Pakistan during the last few years have recharged it, and it has emerged as an active pillar of the state. It marked the beginning of a new constitutional jurisprudence. It has led to an end of period of constitutional deviations and an increased social role of the rule of law, which had the effect of greater awareness amongst the people of their fundamental rights and the values of democracy. This change in constitutional culture slash jurisprudence has five distinct facets. First, 
The events of 90, uh, 2007, when the Chief Justice and judges were suspended, and the state of emergency was imposed in the country, led to a bitter realization that mere formal constitutional legitimacy based on constitutional textual protections cannot safeguard judicial independence. It is, in fact, the legitimacy of the Supreme Court in the eyes of the public as guardians of the values of justice that guarantees its independence and sustain, sustained prestige. Number two, the Supreme Court is not merely mandated by the Constitution, but in fact is bound by the spirit of its office to exercise its independence in order to provide a much necessary check on the actions of the legislature and the executive. Three, the authority of the Supreme Court, especially in that its judicial review jurisdiction, may be usefully extended to a number of areas from which the Supreme Court had historically maintained a distance. In accordance with this realization, the Supreme Court has increasingly exercised its power of judicial review of administrative actions to safeguard the rights of individuals against the excesses of the executive. Fourth, the Supreme Court may exert its constitutional authority to bolster and sustain constitutional democracy and to guard against subversion of the constitutional values. And number five, that it is not sufficient for the Supreme Court of a complex country such as Pakistan to merely implement the law. It is in fact important for the court to display initiative and courage in the face of challenges to the constitutional values from fluctuating majorities are passions of the court. The court has passed through testing times, but those have culminated in institutional vindication. <clears throat> the assertion of judicial independence, the rise of a vibrant bar, a vigilant civil society, and the emergence of an independent media would go a long way in strengthening democracy, political institutions, and in ensuring an expanded enforcement of the rule of law in the country. The idealism reflected and the sacrifices made during the movement launched for judicial independence are a testimony to people's faith in the Constitution and its abiding values. As long as this spirit is alive, the Constitution and the law shall reign supreme. As Leonard Hand rightly observed, and I quote, Liberty lies in the hearts of men and women. When it dies, no constitution, no law, and no court can save it, unquote. And we have proved it through our struggle. Thank you very much.
as Justice uh, Jelani mentioned, he received an award from the American Bar Association, but he could not come to New York to receive that. So the way I met him is that the American Bar asked me to present it to him in Vienna, where we both attended a World Justice Conference. So ultimately, he and the justices got their due from the ABA, and they got to actually have the physical award. I am humbled, of course, to hear the story of the Pakistani judiciary. And I have nothing but the greatest admiration for the courage and the backbone of what they had to stand up to. And so it's with some trepidation that I come to talk to you about what I would say is the soft constitutional crisis that really does pale in comparison to the situations faced by many judges in many countries across the world. Now, my court has been much in the news lately, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. But I want you to know that GPS is so prescient that they chose this topic before the most recent desktop. I do not plan to talk about the merits of any case, because as my colleague Judge Wallace and I know, we don't talk about the merits of pending cases. But we can talk about the atmospherics. So I want to give you some sense of history, then talk about what's happening today, and share with you what I think are some of the consequences of what's happening. Now judge bashing is really nothing new. If you go back to the early days of our history, uh, we had um, President Jefferson, uh, and he didn't do it quite so directly. He was pretty clever. He used his henchmen, if you will, to suggest that he really didn't like some of the Chief Justice's opinions, and even went so far as to get Congress to impeach um, Justice Chase, although it never came to pass because the Senate didn't, wasn't in accord and didn't vote for that. But a lot of this was behind the scenes wrangling. So then 20 years later, we have President Jackson enters the scene, and he's not too happy with Chief Justice Marshall but his criticism, actually, is not of Marshall as a person or as a judge, but he disagrees with him on how to interpret the Constitution. And there were a couple of big cases back then, one involving national banks and another involving tribal land of the Cherokee Indians. And Jackson was really appalled at these decisions. At one point, he basically said, well, they made the decision, let them go out and enforce it. But again, the rhetoric wasn't really quite like we're seeing today. Many of you in this room may even remember in the late 1930s, early 40s, uh, President Roosevelt's court packing plan. Again, a very clever political move behind the scenes. So instead of attacking the justices, he figured he would just change the structure. But the good sense of Congress, the electorate, and others came to pass, and that never happened. And of course, we've seen a number of very heated debates over confirmations of Supreme Court justices, going back in time to Justice Brandeis, uh, to Abe Fortas, and then more recently to Robert Bork. And out of that, of course, came the word that you've been borked, um, which I'll share with you later how I, too, was borked. Um, <laughs> but enough of history, because it was a different time and in many of those times, there was no code of conduct for judges of what they could and couldn't do. And also, many of the judges were moving back and forth between politics and the bench. It's something that you don't seem to see today. So while you will hear, oh, this is nothing new, I do think that what we're seeing today is something new. So let me go fast forward now. And what we're seeing today, I think, are an increasing pressures of personal attacks and litmus tests on judges. Now, I want to be clear that judges are not immune from verbal or other attack. First of all, we're not in a popularity contest. We know that, or we wouldn't have signed up for this job. But on the other hand, we also should be criticized and can be criticized, and our opinions 
should be criticized because that's part of the civil discourse in our society. What's interesting though is that of the cases that we see, and in the Ninth Circuit we have between 12 and 14,000 cases every year, it's a tiny, tiny percentage of those that some people would call political or controversial. And what dominates the discussion are those one or two cases. Now we hope the public is interested in the other 11,998 cases because they do affect the lives of individual people. They do affect our constitutional rights. They affect business, they affect international law, and they affect the environment. But of course, what we've seen is the sound bite prevails, and so a single case dominates, and that is the discussion. But I would suggest to you that it's one thing to criticize a decision, to disagree with it, and it's another to make attacks that undermine both the independence of the judiciary and the integrity of the judiciary as an institution. So let me give you a couple of examples. George W. Bush. President Bush was not happy about the Supreme Court's ruling in Guantanamo and giving certain rights to the prisoners in Guantanamo. So here's what he said, and I think it's, it's very interesting. Basically, President Bush said, will abide by the court's decision, but that doesn't mean I have to like it. I think he capsulized and captured just perfectly the kind of debate we ought to be having. Yes, he disagreed, but he was really clear, I will abide by the decision, and I will not suggest, as has happened at different points and in different countries, that we should somehow abdicate and not abide by the decision. Now, during the Clinton administration, there was a famous case of a judge called Judge Baer out of the federal court in New York. It was a drug case, and he made a preliminary ruling to not admit certain of the drug evidence. And as you might imagine, whether you're a lawyer or not, if you've been accused of a drug crime and there's no drug evidence, well, that's a good thing if you're a defendant because there's no evidence to convict you on. Well, there was a huge uproar. First Congress got involved, they said we should impeach uh, Judge Baer. Then President Clinton got involved. Clinton was a lawyer, you may recall. And there was a suggestion out of the White House that he too might call for the judge to step down because of this outrageous decision. So unlike President Bush, here we had both Congress and the White House, which later totally backed down once they realized what they had said but both of them initially suggesting the way to solve this is let's impeach or get rid of Judge Baer. There was enormous pressures. Now keep in mind, when we make a decision, virtually all of our decisions are subject to reconsideration. We get thousands of petitions every year in the Ninth Circuit saying, hey, we didn't like the decision, would you reconsider? And we like to think we have an open mind and that we can reconsider. What happened in this particular case is Judge Baer reconsidered, and he changed his decision. So the question was, was he exercising judicial independence, taking another look at it, or was he the object of intimidation? And we'll never know. And finally, I want to just touch briefly on the most recent attacks. One of the more recent attacks was made against a judge here in San Diego, Judge Curiel, and it involved a commercial case involving Mr. Trump. And Trump said that Judge Curiel could not be fair because he was Mexican. Well, the truth was, he's not Mexican. He was born back in the Midwest, and his parents are of Mexican heritage. But again, the suggestion that a judge couldn't be fair because of that. And then we came to these cases involving the immigration order. And there's probably nothing so divisive or debated in our country these days as that topic. But when the judge in Seattle, who happened to be a Republican appointee, made his initial decision, he was then called out for being a so-called judge. And in the press it was suggested that if we suffered from a terrorist attack, you could lay it at Judge Robart's feet. 
The case then came to the Ninth Circuit where the president deemed us to be out of control, ridiculous, and also a threat to national security. Now, I think there's a difference between a public attack and a disagreement with a decision and the kind of decisions and attacks that go after a judge individually for his integrity. If there is an ethical violation, absolutely, then you go after the judge personally because we have a very high standard of ethics. But to go after the institution and to go after the judge personally, I think, is really kind of a horse of a different color. The same thing is true in the confirmation hearings. They've really turned into a kabuki theater type of operation where it doesn't really have to do with the person's independence, their temperament, or their credentials. Because I can assure you that virtually all of the people who've been nominated would score high on all of those counts. But instead, they're going after personal attacks and they're trying to force people into saying, well, how would you rule on this? And then when the person sensibly says, I can't tell you in advance how it would rule, then they say that he's skirting the question or not answering the question. And so these recent judicial hearings, which you know years ago they didn't even have hearings, and then they didn't have public hearings. Now we have both. And I think it's a good idea. I think it's transparency in both our congressional process and judicial appointments. But it also has taken on a patina that's far different from what it should be when you have basically the judges becoming kind of battering rams for other political reasons. So why does this matter at all? I think that the kind of attacks I'm talking about, it's not a distinction without a difference. And let me give you three reasons why I think it matters. First of all, I think it matters <coughs> because it undermines judicial independence. And it means that you have political elites and others who are basically telling the public that there's no respect for the judiciary, that we don't respect the independence of the judiciary. And where it gets dangerous is where criticism can cross over to intimidation. Now I recognize that as a federal judge I hold a very special position because I have a lifetime appointment. And that of course is one of the beauties that our drafters wrote into the Constitution is that we would have a lifetime appointment so we would not be subject to political vicissitudes. The same is not true of judges or elected judges because they are on the line every four years. And again, it's the anecdote, it's the single case that's called out about those judges. So I think it matters because it really strikes at the heart of what we think has been really a premier aspect of the American judiciary and that's our ability to sustain our judicial independence. A second reason, and one that I would say is probably an unintended consequence by those who make these personal attacks, relates to the security of judges. Because it's not a question of just tweeting or putting something on the internet or speaking with a reporter. But the reality is, when you legitimize these kind of attacks, you also embolden some people who want to do more than have a discourse, but instead they want to threaten, and ultimately some want to harm and injure. So yes, we've had judges killed. Not long ago, a judge's family was killed in her home, husband, <coughs> mother, and father. We've had judges shot at on the bench. We've had courthouses blown up. And I would suggest that this is probably an unintended consequence of those who want to attack the judiciary in a very personal way. Justice Jelani mentioned the question of religious freedom, and I can say my family and I were at the other end of that, needing judicial security on an issue that involved 
religious freedom. And often those cases are the kind of cases that cause great public debate and cause great public disagreement. And the third reason that I think we ought to take note of these kinds of attacks is because I think ultimately it will affect who wants to be on a court. Why would somebody who's making a very good salary, and in some cases lawyers making millions of dollars, want to take a huge pay cut to come and be the object of this, not to mention the security risks. But that also ties into the confirmation process. And the more divisive we are in the confirmation process, the more we focus on the political aspect of it instead of temperament, quality, intellectual ability, I think you limit those who will come forward and say, I want to be in public service. I feel it's a privilege to be in public service. I did wait three and a half years in a confirmation crisis that they thought would never end, and then magically it did, and they decided to start confirming some judges again. And my dear husband, Peter Cowley, and my family lived through that, and they lived through all the news attacks on myself and other judges um, who were really caught as, I would say, um, kind of judicial or political footballs. We learned it's not really about us, of course. Um, you might think it is. Your family might think it is. But it's not really about the judges. It's really about a larger discourse that really goes far beyond an individual judge or even an individual court or even an individual institution. It's interesting because when we think about courts and independence, one of the things we forget about is that under a constitutional structure, the role of the courts in the protecting the rights of minorities and protecting constitutional rights is really, really important. And I like to think back to a, a quotation from Justice Black. Hardly any one of individuals would label a liberal. But he says, that courts are havens of refuge for those who might otherwise suffer because they're either helpless, they're in need, or because they're victims of prejudice and public vindication or admiration. Now, Justice Black was really just saying what many other jurists have said over the years, that the courts act as a backstop, that we have this quite amazing system of separation of powers, and it's really worked out quite well so far. The Congress is a pushback to the executive. The courts are a backstop to make sure that we're following the Constitution and that we're protecting the Constitution. But they need to work with each other. And while there are some oppositional forces, and I recognize that, and I think there's a certain tension that's very healthy, I think we do have to ask ourselves, when we ask our children to have civil discourse, why aren't we having civil discourse? One of the most amazing things to us as US judges is that we've spent many years, like Justice Giuliani said, on behalf of the American Bar and other organizations supporting foreign judiciaries when they were under attack. We're now getting all kinds of letters of support of, to the US judiciary now from our foreign colleagues. So it's a very interesting and heartening thing to us to see that. And of course, the American Bar and the American lawyers did go out in the streets during the time of the Pakistani crisis. And to some extent, we've been saying, you know, this is not a situation where they've removed an entire Supreme Court, for example, like in Ecuador. This is not a case where they're killing all the judges. And we want to be clear that we recognize the difference in that. So where does it leave us? Let me just take you back to one of our great founders, Alexander Hamilton. And he famously said that the judiciary does not have the power of the sword, of course, meaning military power, nor do we have the power of the purse. We don't control any money. But what we're left with is judgment. 
So I think what we're asking is let us judge. Let us not be thrown out there as a judicial punching bag. And in my view, things will right themselves. They have for over 200 years. I don't see this as a crisis that will continue. And the reason I don't is because I think that the judiciary ultimately enjoys the support of the people and the common sense of our citizens. So thank you for letting Justice Giuliani and me talk with you about something that's near and dear to our heart, the independence of the judiciary.